So let's now turn our attention to understanding the foundation on which the theme of love rests. This is why we started here with formation. As I say, we need to have the flame of love, not the flame of John or the flame of Marcel, the flame of Eileen, but the flame of love. And the flame of love rests squarely at the heart of the church. So we need to understand the heart of the church, what the church is all about. So what happens in somebody's life or in a parish when we invite the flame of love in? What happens when the flame of love comes into our life? Well, several things. First and foremost, it blinds Satan in our lives and, and those around us. Right, this is the principal and only purpose of the flame of love of the Blessed Virgin, Elizabeth wrote. But it does even more. It leads us to a life of grace that makes Jesus present and displaces Satan. That's kind of the how of how it works, of blinding Satan. It leads us to a life of grace that makes Jesus present as the effect of grace, and that displaces Satan. Right? As, as Jesus said, she herself promised an outpouring of graces so great as have not happened on earth since the word became flesh. The flame of love also focuses us firmly on the gospel, on salvation through union with Jesus as the effect of grace. To me, this is just brilliant. This is such a, of course, our blessed mother is brilliant, but it, it, it takes the sublime truths of theology. It takes the gospel and it focuses it back for everyone in the church. You know, kind of like you know, in the days before people could read, we had statuary and stained glass windows to teach people the, the gospel. And here now we have the flame of love, which is helping us to focus people back in on the heart and core of the gospel. If you were to turn to most people in the pews and ask them, what's the gospel? They might not really know what it is. They might not have a good way to describe it. They might have pieces of it, parts of it. They might not get it right. In the flame of love, we find ourselves being drawn through the prayers and the practices of the flame of love to focus right on the gospel. And there's something else that happens that I didn't put in, in your notes, but it is important that happens in lives in the flame of love. And this is important when it comes to spreading the flame of love outside of the church. Because remember, the flame of love is not just for those in the church. Our Blessed Mother said that it was for all those signed with the sign of the cross, you know, not just those in the Catholic Church. And then there's a note in the diary that says, and to those who are not even baptized. Now, in the diary, there are definitions of what the flame of love is. The most important one that we come to all the time, and it is the most important one, is that the flame of love is Jesus himself, who is made present by the effect of grace. But there is another definition in the, of the flame of love that our Blessed Mother gives. That's important for us to understand. And she gave it when the flame of love first came. And on April 13th, 1962, in giving the flame of love, she describes the flame of love this way. With this flame full of graces that I give you from my heart, ignite all the hearts in the entire country. Now, let's think about that for a second. This is Hungary, right? Let's set ourselves in the context. Hungary, 1962. Well, who make up the entire country? Well, there's a large Catholic population. In Hungary, there's also a large Protestant population, right? If I recall correctly, Elizabeth's father was a Protestant. Her mother was a Catholic. And this is communist Hungary. There's a very large atheist population. And yet our Blessed Mother wants to light all the hearts in the entire country. Let this flame go from heart to heart. This is the miracle becoming the blaze whose dazzling light will blind Satan. This is the fire of love of union. Right here she defines it. This is the fire of love of union, which I obtained from the Heavenly Father through the merits of the wounds of my divine son. So I asked Yuzu Kindleman, Elizabeth's grandson and our international coordinator, what's this? Fire of love of union. And he looked at me kind of funny and he said, fire of flame of union? That's that's not in the diary. And again, it highlights the challenge of translation. Sometimes you just can't easily translate. Sometimes it takes a paragraph to, to, to explain a sentence. And so it is in the case with this. So the best that Father Rona could do was, you know, uh, amor de union, which we translate into English as love of union. But the way Jesus described it in Hungarian was quite beautiful. He said, when you take two things and you join them together, you need glue to hold them together. The flame of love is that glue. 
the flame of love is that love that binds us. I can only think that binds us to Jesus, right? The unity prayer that binds us. So this is what happens when the flame of love leaps to the heart of someone outside the church. It doesn't bypass the sacraments. It doesn't bypass the need for baptism. The theological examination of the diary used to approve it is very clear about that. And it says that the flame of love does, does not bypass the sacraments. Instead, when we spread the flame of love to someone who's not part of the church, it places in them this binding love, this love which draws them deeply to our Savior. They may not understand why, they may not understand how, they may not understand what's happening in their life, but something is going to light a flame in them which will draw them to the sacraments, which will draw them to the church. Maybe now, maybe later, maybe at the moment of death, but something is going to change in them to draw them, to bind them to our Lord in love. So we do have the opportunity, and we should take the opportunity to spread the flame of love everywhere. You know, we may have family, we have friends, we have neighbors who don't believe, don't believe as we are. There's nothing that says we can't turn to them and say, you know, I know we don't believe the same, but we've got a problem. Let's, let's pray about it. Let's pray together. We have a problem in our family. Let's come and pray together. We have a problem in our neighborhood. Come to my house for coffee and, and, and pray. Let's pray together. And you know, probably they'll say no, but they might surprise you and say yes. And then when the flame of love leaps to their heart and they are bound to our Lord with this love, they won't understand this love that surpasses knowledge. They'll be drawn to our Lord. And we will spread the flame of love everywhere. So what happens when a person or a parish receives the flame of love? Satan is blinded. It leads us to a life of grace. It focuses us firmly on the gospel. And it lights that fire of love that unites us to our Lord. And that, that, that focus on the gospel is important. Because it is. That gospel is literally our salvation through union with Jesus as the effect of grace. Right? Salvation is God is inviting us into his very life. The life of the Trinity. Eternal life. That's what we are called to. The life of the Trinity. That's what we're going to talk about. The only way to be joined to that life of the Trinity is through the one who is both fully God and fully man. That's why we make such a big deal about that in the creed. That's what in technical terms hypostatic union is all about. That's why it's so important because God is inviting us into his divinity. Jesus, in the liturgy of the church, in the liturgy of the hours, the beautiful prayer that is at the end of Psalm 45, talks about how Jesus, when he took flesh, made a marriage of humanity and divinity. So the only way for us to partake of the life of the Trinity is to be joined, literally joined, not figuratively joined, but literally joined to the one who is both God and man. The one who literally joins us to the blessed Trinity because he is both God and man. That's why we have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. That's why life is in his son that we read in 1 John 5 and verse 10 and 11. That's why Jesus says, I am the way. Because the only way to be joined to the life of the Trinity is to be literally joined to the one who is both God and man. That's the gospel. And that happens by the effect of grace. That's what the unity prayer is all about. These are all related. Blinding Satan, leaving a life of grace, being in love with our Lord, and being focused on the gospel. So let's talk for a moment about how Satan is blinded. Right? That's the purpose of what we do. Jesus came to destroy the works of the evil one. So how does that happen? Let's again turn ourselves to the diary. <clears throat> and Jesus says, going from heart to heart, she, our blessed mother, pla places in your hands the flame of love of her heart. Through your prayers and sacrifices, it will blind Satan who wants to rule over families. Now, again, our prayer and sacrifice only for the apostle of the flame of love? No, it's for everyone. Everyone is involved in blinding Satan through prayers and sacrifices. Also, there are specific graces attached to the prayers of the flame of love. So please don't misunderstand me when I say the flame of love is much more than a prayer devotion. It's not to make light of the prayers. These prayers are incredibly powerful, incredibly important with their power to blind Satan and free souls from purgatory. All right? 1963. Elizabeth writes, pray constantly to the Blessed Virgin with this prayer. Our mother, spread the effect of grace of your flame of love over all of humanity. Amen. Each time you pray invoking the flame of love for all humanity, Satan is blinded 
and loses his dominion over souls. So this is the way Satan is blinded with the flame of love, Hail Mary, and this ejaculatory prayer, as we call it. In the unity prayer itself, Jesus says, this prayer, referring to the unity prayer, is an instrument in your hands. By collaborating with me, Satan will be blinded by it. And because of his blindness, souls will not be led into sin. So we blind Satan through this prayer, these beautiful, powerful prayers that are given to us. But there's more. There are other ways in which we blind Satan. Our Blessed Mother tells us that participation in the Holy Mass is what helps the most to blind Satan. Why? Because it helps the most to make Jesus present because it is the most powerful conduit of grace. So Mass, and again, is Mass for the flame of love only? No, it's for everyone. Adoration, right? Mary says, whenever someone does adoration in a spirit of atonement or visits the blessed sacrament, as long as it lasts, Satan loses his dominion on the parish souls. Blinded, he ceases to reign on souls. But there's even more than that. Here Mary says, and again, one of my many favorite quotes from the diary, throughout the day, you should offer me your daily chores for the glory of God. Such offering made in a state of grace also contributes to the blinding of Satan. She talks about in a greater and increasing range of activities. So, yes, how can it be that, you know, in our, our washing the dishes, our doing the laundry, our, our, our time at work, our whatever we're doing in our daily chores, we are able to blind Satan. Why? Again, all because of grace, because of living this life of grace. This blinding of Satan is not magic. It's spiritual engineering. When we do all the things that Mary asks us to do, these are all the great practices of grace. Again, in the flame of love, there's not a lot that's new. We have the prayers that are new, but it's Mary calling us back to all the great practices of grace we have always had but have tended to neglect. What's new in the flame of love is the urgency, the power, and the intensity of the love with which we do this, the greatest outpouring of graces. It's the grace we have always had, but now more powerful in greater abundance because now we need it to finally end this, to end the reign of Satan and to break this darkness and to drive it back when just it seems to be its, its greatest and its most powerful. This is when the tide will turn and it will be driven back by doing the life of grace and by the prayers of the flame of love. Mary is calling us back to focus on the gospel, to focus the church. Instead of being diffused and not accomplishing very much at all, now the entire coordinated efforts of the church are focused on what the church is all about, on the gospel. God is inviting us into his love, into his life. This is only possible as the effect of grace. This grace unites us literally to Jesus, the God-man. And union with Jesus drives out Satan's influence and souls are saved. That's the gospel and it's the flame of love. This is how the flame of love focuses us and focuses the entire church. In the prayers of the flame of love, we learn the gospel and the role of grace. Every time we pray a cynical, every time we pray the prayers of the flame of love, we are reminded and the gospel is brought into focus. There are only three devotional elements of the flame of love, right? It's not all about a lot of devotion. Only three devotional elements in the flame of love. The meditation on the five wounds that tell us the what of salvation, what we're called to be, what salvation is calling us to be. The flame of love, Hail Mary, right? Spread the effective grace of your flame of love over all of humanity. This is the how of salvation, how it happens. And the unity prayer that powerful, beautiful unity prayer, which is the why of salvation, why we are made, why we are saved, how we are called to be, what we are to become. So when you think of it, every time we pray the flame of love, we are given a primer in the gospel that we are called to love as God loves, as shown on the cross. This is only possible as the effect of grace. The effect of grace then leads us into complete and literal union with Jesus, which unites us to the life of the Holy Trinity. And when Jesus is made present, Satan is driven out and souls are saved. We see the gospel portrayed in the prayers of the flame of love, and we see it lived in the practices of the flame of love. The practices of the flame of love, in those we live the gospel and the life of grace. So it's like we have lecture and we have lab. Right? We learn about the gospel and the flame of love and the role of grace. 
and then we live the gospel and the flame of love and the life of grace. And when we do that, when we pray and when we live, Satan is blinded. But now we need to understand the gospel and grace. If we don't understand the gospel and grace, we won't understand the flame of love. It'll become just another devotion, just another set of prayers that we say. But Mary said she didn't want this just to become another prayer formula. She wants to shake the world by this. So we need to say, no, this is not just another set of prayers that you add to all the other sets of prayers that you pray. No, this is so much more. That's why we need to understand salvation, the gospel, and grace. Sometimes we use these terms. We don't really understand them. We don't know how to work with them. And I tell this story on myself because it, I enjoy telling the story because it just shows people how stupid and idiotic and prideful and sinful I can be. But it also shows that sometimes we just don't know what we're talking about. I remember, you know, years ago, I was newly graduated from college. Here I have my brand new shiny theology degree with which I'm going to change the world. And I'm heading back across country, driving from New York back to uh, to uh, from California to New York and all puffed up in pride and arrogance and thinking I know everything. And uh, driving across country in my trusty old Renault R12, that's quite a story in itself. I think we See, we lost the muffler in the in the Grand Canyon, and we lost the starter in the Rockies, and we lost the Isla Pulley in the plains of Colorado and, and Pueblo, and we lost the speedometer cable in Oklahoma and the battery in Oklahoma. And <laughs> finally, we limp into Fort Smith, Arkansas. And we pull into Fort Smith, Arkansas, into the gas station, and it's clearly a born-again gas station. And there are just all these young men just falling all over themselves, full of smiles and bouncing and full of energy, to, to greet people and to service them, kind of a, a nice thing. And uh, so I pull up to the, to the pump and the fellow comes by to gas up the car. And I used to keep this uh, little Bible in my pocket, in my shirt pocket. You know, so if I had a break, I had you know, nothing to do, I was tied up, I could pull out my Bible and read the scriptures. And so this fellow comes up to me and he sees the Bible in my pocket and his face just lights up and he says to me, oh brother, are you saved? And me and my great, arrogance and stupidity and pride and sinfulness said saved from what he said you know brother are you saved and he said saved from what and his face kind of fell and he said no you know saved well i was really stupid and really sinful and really wrong but the point i was stupidly and sinfully trying to make is we say these things we have no idea what we mean what does that mean Let's take a look and see how did St. Paul describe the message of salvation? How does St. Paul describe the message of salvation? Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 to 21. Let me pull up my Bible. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. And let me share my screen. Where Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Hold on to that line. We're going to come back to that in, in a couple of weeks, a couple of months. Uh, very important. Now, all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Remember that phrase, too. We're going to come back to that in a little while. But he's begging, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. The message of reconciliation. Now let's stop and think about that for a minute. Who are we in relation to God? We're probably closer to a mosquito than we are to God. So let's think about that. How would you reconcile a mosquito with a human? I'm not being funny. How would you reconcile a mosquito with a human? Well, in effect, you'd have to enable the mosquito to become like a human in order to be reconciled to the human. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to relate. And this is what is happening in salvation. That in salvation, 
we must become like God. We must become nothing short of divine so that we can relate to God as God does. Salvation, the miracle of Christianity, is to transform our human nature into the very nature of God. Again, let's go to the scriptures. This is not, you know, fourth John. This is not John Sullivan babbling along. This is the scripture. When we crack open the book, we can be surprised at what's in there. We are called to be transformed from the human nature into the very nature of God. Let's look at 2 Peter 1 and verse 4. 2 Peter 1 and verse 4. Not verse 5 like I just went to. We'll go back one. Uh, 2 Peter 1 and verse 4. For by these he has granted to us precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of what? Does that really say that in the Bible? That you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. I mean, that should smack us right between the eyes. That's what we're called, to be partakers of the divine nature so we can be reconciled to God, so we can relate to God as God, not just as humans, not just as mosquitoes. We become partakers of the divine nature. This is not just Peter. Let's look at John, 1 John 3 and verse 2. Type it right, otherwise it takes me to the book of Revelation. 1 John 3 and verse 2. Yep, come on. Let's go. All right, we'll pull it up this way. We'll go first, John. Three and verse two. That's interesting. I'm wondering if the battery in my keyboard has died. Suddenly it's not typing. Let's see. Will it? All right, first John three and, oh, there it goes. Okay, first John three and verse two. Where John writes, beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Remarkable statement, but it's not just Peter and it's not just John. Let's go over to Romans 5 to Paul. Paul Romans 5 and verse 2 through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of what? The glory of God. Do you know that's your hope? That's our hope? That's the hope of salvation? This hope of the glory of God to participate in the very divine nature. That's what this Christianity thing is about. It's not being a, a nice person as, as we might think on our own. It's not being a good person. It's being a divine person, a holy person, partaking of the divine nature. We are called to have a God relationship with God, not a mosquito relationship with God, not a human relationship with God, but a God relationship with God. That can only happen when we partake of the divine nature so we can relate to God as God has related to himself throughout all eternity. This is what we were made for. This goes all the way back to our creation. Let's go to the creation account, to Genesis 1. We'll start in verse 11. So we're there again. Now, unfortunately, in the New American Bible revised, for some reason, they eliminated this, parent, this uh, pattern. They translated it differently. In almost every other translation, the Dewey Reams, any translation, you'll see a very specific pattern in the creation account. So here's Genesis 1, verse 11. When God says that the earth sprout vegetation and plants yielding seed and fruit trees of the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. It was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And we go on again. We go to the lights and the, and the, and the heavens. And then we see more of creation of living beings. Right? In verse 20, God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and birds flying above the expanse of heaven. And God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves in which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And he continues, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters and the seas, let the birds multiply on earth the fifth day. And now we get to the creatures on the earth. Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind 
cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And then the pattern changes. And God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, not after the mankind, after the God kind. This is what we were made for. We were made to have this relationship. We were made to have this friendship with God. You know, picture God in the garden. You know, and he loves his creation. You can see him walking. Maybe the, the bird comes on his shoulder and he, he talks to the bird. Maybe the butterfly lights on his hand and he grabs the lion by the mane and he rubs his neck. But they can't really relate to God. Then he comes to Adam. Then he comes to man. And man is different. He can hold his hand and walk with him. And he can have a relationship. And man can love God back. We are called to have a God relationship with God. A true friendship with God. Let's go to John 15, verses 9 through 15. John 15, verses 9 through 15. Again, let me share my screen. <clears throat> Just as the Father has loved me, I have loved you. Now, again, let's, let's stop and think about the words, not just let them bounce off our eyeballs. As the Father has loved me, the love of the Trinity, the way in which the Father has loved me, the second person of the Trinity, the Word, I have also loved you. Abide in my love, this love of the Trinity. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. All right? Come down to verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another. But he doesn't stop there. Not loving one another the way that we love our wives and our husbands and everybody loves everybody else, whether they're tax collectors or pagans or anyone else. This is my command, that you love one another just as I have loved you. How did Jesus love us? With the same love the Father has for him, with the love of the Trinity. So we are to love one another just as Jesus has loved us with the love of the Trinity. Greater love has no man than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. He can't understand, just like a mosquito can't understand a human. We can't understand God until we have this relationship with him. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. This is what we are called to. This is what our salvation is about. This is the relationship we have with God. The fullness of reconciliation with God is when we love God as he loves us. The fullness of reconciliation is when we love God as he loves us. Let's go back to the Gospel of John, a critically important chapter. John 17. This is the high priestly prayer. These are the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples before going to the garden. John 17 and verse 22. John 17 and verse 22. The glory which you have given me I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me. Sound like unity prayer, right? I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them. Right? So the world may know that you, Father, love them, even as you have loved me. Again, we come back to that. Do we know that we are loved by the Father the same way the Father loves the Son? That's how great his love for us is. He loves us even as he loves Jesus. And Jesus says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. Right? He has a God relationship with God. And these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them and will make it known. Why? This is the very last thing Jesus said to his disciples before going to the garden. This is the most important thing he could leave with us. 
I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me, the love of the Trinity, so that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. We, we as incapable and as weak and as miserable as we are, we are to love. We are to have the love of the Holy Trinity within us. We are to love with God's selfless love. This is the reconciliation. Bridging that gap between God and man is the plan of salvation. Now, if we try to approach God with just our everyday human love, our everyday human goodness, it's, it's just like we're still a mosquito. We will fail. We will not be saved if our love and our good is just our human love, our mosquito love. It has to be the love of the Trinity. This is what salvation is. Salvation is so much more than just forgiveness. Salvation is more than just the forgiveness of our sins. Our justification, our being made right or being made righteous is composed of two, two parts. We need redemption and we need sanctification. For the sake of time, I won't go very deeply into redemption. I'll just gloss over the scriptures that I have in your notes there. But what is a redeemer? Again, we use these words, sweet redeemer, great redeemer, Jesus is my redeemer. What does that mean? Well, we have two accounts of what a redeemer is in the scriptures. In Exodus 13, it talks about the firstborn. Right after the death of the firstborn in Egypt, every firstborn was consecrated to the Lord. So every firstborn of your flock, you would bring and you would sacrifice. It would die. So what do you do with your firstborn children? Do you sacrifice them so that they die? No, there's no child sacrifice. Instead, an animal dies instead. We redeem them. A redeemer, that lamb, is the one who takes the place of death for the one who would otherwise have to die. In Leviticus 25, we see it financially. If you were so poor that you sold yourself into slavery, someone could come and pay your debt, the debt that you couldn't pay, and redeem you from slavery. And so it is with Jesus who pays the debt we cannot pay. And so he redeems us. But salvation is not just redemption. Once the debt is be paid, has been paid, how do we keep from falling back into debt? Once our sins have been forgiven, how do we keep from sinning again? And that's where sanctification comes in. We must be made holy so that we sin no more. And that's the effect of grace. If we don't understand sanctification, we are in danger of falling into either of two ditches, as we so often do. All right, the first ditch is that our sins are only covered. We will never be made holy. We will never be made worthy. We cannot become righteous. Just our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. This was the ditch of the early Protestant reformers. And thankfully, many, to their great credit, our, our Protestant brothers and sisters have recognized that error and come to embrace the Catholic teaching on this subject. But that's the first ditch that will never be righteous, that our sins are only covered by the blood of Jesus. The second ditch, which is more of the contemporary ditch we see today, is that we're good enough. We're fine just the way we are. You know, in our world, we're just fed on self-esteem, on being free of guilt and being free of shame. Those are bad things. We don't want to feel guilty. We don't want to be shameful. You know, build up ourselves. Now, actually, some people are so broken and so destroyed by being abused and being beaten down. We do need to lift them up a little bit because they're so broken. We need to get them to the point they can reach God's ladder of grace. But no, no, we don't need to be told, most of us, how great we are. In reality, we're miserable. We're miserable. Even our good and our love are often sinful. Even our good and our love. We are a mess. Not always. Sometimes we see those glimpses of original justice, as we call it, shine through. And we really do love the way we're supposed to love. But most of the time we are pulled, pulled back into our selfishness, not only in our overt evil, but even in our love and in our good. Let's go over to Mark 2. Mark 2, verses 16 and 17. And we'll see again how Jesus emphasizes this. In Mark 2, verse 16, when the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. 
remember when I first read that many, many years ago, I thought, oh, okay, so he didn't come to call the Pharisees because they're already righteous. He came to call sinners. No, 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 no. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the fact that we need to recognize that we're sick. This really came, came home to me one day when we were doing a ministerial visit. As many of you know, I left the church for many, many years. And when I was in my ministerial training, I was sent to, to work with a very good, very wise, very experienced pastor. And this was a church that did adult baptism. And so we get this call from this woman who wants to be baptized. She wants to be baptized into the church. And so we go to visit her and she's talking to us very pleasantly. She's telling us about her childhood. She had grown up in one of the islands of the Caribbean. And, uh, and she's telling us about her childhood and how she was always a very good girl. And it was never in her to sin. And the minister didn't miss a beat. He said, oh, we have a problem then, because you see, we only baptize sinners. <laughs> you know? And immediately, bam, oh, there the scripture came alive. You know, this woman wanted to be baptized, but she didn't recognize that she even sinned at all. That we have to recognize that so that we can come to be healed. Yes, Jesus didn't come to call the righteous. He called, came to call sinners. And we have to recognize our need as sinners, even in our love and in our good much of the time to repent of it, to be healed, and to be made whole with the love of God. Let's go to another famous scripture, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. Where through the prophet Isaiah, God tells us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So again, let's ask the question. Let's not just let the, eye, the, the words bounce off our eyeballs. What do you mean, God? What do you mean? What's the difference between your thoughts and our thoughts? Why are your thoughts as high above, as separate as the heavens are from the earth from your thoughts? What's the difference between your thoughts and our thoughts? Well, this is something that struck me so powerfully in my first year of, of theology. I remember that it just, just confronted me. I could tell there was something wrong in my life. Something something just wasn't right. And uh, I go to all my, my advisors and all my counselors and they say, no, you're doing fine. You're praying, you're studying, you're, you're, you're doing fine. You're doing just great. And I know no, something is wrong. You know, and I've come to recognize when these things happen in life, it's just God you know, massaging my, my stiff neck. You know, I kind of joke that I'm, I'm half Irish and I'm half Italian, but not just any Italian, the Calabrese Italian, well, the notoriously hard headed ones. So I figure if God can get through to me, he can get through to anyone. You know, so he's, he's there massaging my neck. I know something is wrong and I don't know what it is. And I'm stuck on a scripture. I'm stuck on the book of Romans, Romans 8 and verse 7. And in Romans 8, it's the Holy Spirit chapter. And Paul is talking about the difference between the carnal mind and the, the spiritual mind, the fleshly mind and the, the mind of the spirit, those who have the Holy Spirit and those who do not. And he says in Romans 8, 7, at the time of the translation I was reading, that the carnal mind is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can be. And it was that last phrase that threw me off, that the carnal mind, the minding of the flesh, the mind without the Holy Spirit, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And I thought, wait a second, wait a second, why not? Can I just look at this law and say, oh, this is a great idea, this law. I'm going to live by this law. I'm not going to kill. I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to covet. I'm not going to steal. Why can't we do that on our own without the Holy Spirit? In fact, didn't Paul himself say that he was blameless before the law? Let's look at Philippians 3. Philippians 3 verses 4 through 6. So here is Paul who has just told us in Romans 8 that we can't be subject to the law. And he says he was doing it fine, right? He says, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless found blameless. Even the parents of, of John the Baptist, right? Zechariah and Elizabeth. How do we describe them? They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the law, but they don't have the Holy Spirit yet. Paul doesn't have the Holy Spirit yet. How can he say that we are not subject to the law of God and cannot be? What's going on? What's he talking about? 
I thought, okay, let's think about this. Maybe he's talking about love. Right? You boil down the commandments and you come down to the two great commandments. Love God and, and love neighbor. Right? Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and neighbor as yourself. And you keep boiling the law down. You keep boiling the law down. You come to love. Romans 13, 10. Right? Love is the fulfillment of the law. I thought, huh, that doesn't make things better. That makes it worse. Do, do only Christians love? Do only people with the Holy Spirit love? Don't atheists love their husband? And don't you know Muslim parents love their children? And don't Hindu children love their parents? What, what does he mean? What's he talking about? And I had to understand that there is a big difference, that there are two different righteousnesses. There are two different loves and if we don't understand this we don't know where we're going with salvation because our salvation is all about learning that love that righteousness that comes from god as we read in second corinthians 5 not the righteousness of the law and paul says this as we continue on in philippians 3 let's go back there philippians 3 and continue on right so in verse 6 he says you know as as uh as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Two different righteousnesses. And it's just this righteousness that comes from God through faith in Christ on the basis of faith that we cannot do without the Holy Spirit. In fact, there are not just two righteousnesses. There are two loves. And really, the answer that dawned upon me way back then as my first year of theology, was one of the linchpin scriptures of the entire Bible, Philippians 2. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 3, where Paul actually, it's not even from Paul, he quotes a hymn. We believe this is a hymn of the early church. And Paul tells to us, and Philippians is a, is a very important book, because so many of the letters of Paul are written to churches that were in trouble. You know, Galatia, you stupid Galatians, you know, Corinthians, our mess. Philippi is a strong church. So Paul can deal with very mature topics in the book of Philippians. And he says to the Philippians, these very mature Christians, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So here is the mind of Jesus. Here is the thought of God that's far above our thoughts, like the heavens and the earth. Here, here is that second love, that different love. How does he describe this mind of Jesus, this mind of God? Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not grasp equality with God, regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped. And the Greek is, is holding on to, not reaching for, but holding on to. In other words, Jesus is God. And yet he's not grasping onto this saying, I got mine. I'm not giving it to anyone else. I'm not letting go of this. He did not regard his equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Why did Jesus do this? Why did Jesus do this? What was there to gain? I mean, if he wanted humans, he could have you know, gotten rid of our, this sorry lot and made a whole new lot for himself. Jesus had everything. He was entirely fulfilled. There was nothing Jesus needed. He is entirely fulfilled in the life of the Trinity. He is loved. He has everything. He has nothing that he needs. You know, you really can't buy a gift for Jesus, right? He has everything. So why did he do this? He did this for one reason alone. He did this for love. He did this for love that did not get anything in return. That's the difference between the two loves. 
There is a love that loves because. There is a love that loves because of what inspires us to love and what makes us love, what we get that fulfills our needs. And there is a love that is the love of God, where he loves because that's what he is. There is a godly love and there is a human love. There is an entirely selfless love that we see on the cross and there is a selfish love. There is a love that comes from within, right? We don't say in Christianity that God loves. Other religions say that. We don't say God loves. We say God is love. That love flows from what he is, who he is. And there is a love that's externally reinforced that comes from others. There is a love that's eternally sustainable. And there's a love that is unsustainable. Again, this is all theory, but it's very practical. Think of what God is doing. God is so practical. God is calling us to live in eternity, right? We're called for eternal life. So therefore, we need to live an eternally sustainable lifestyle. We need to live a way that brings joy and happiness for, for all eternity. That's not the way we live right now. That's not the way our love works right now. In fact, it's interesting in much of, of classical mythology, the way the gods could curse a human being was to give them eternal life. Eternity living the way we're living would be hell. It is hell. You know, hell, yes, is a place of punishment. But, you know, hell is a place where everybody does what they want to do. That's what hell is. Hell is the place where everybody does what they want to do, no matter what the impact on anyone else. And that's a horrible place. God is calling us to eternity. So, therefore, we need a love that is eternally sustainable, not one that only loves for a certain period of time, not one that only loves as long as we have the reinforcement that makes us love. Here's an interesting quote I'll share with you. It's from a counseling text I had in college by Gerard Ingen, the skilled helper. And he writes, in a sense, reinforcement, what we get back, right? Reinforcement is the central principle of behavior. Beings that are not God by their very nature. Why well, should ring a bell, right? Beings that are not God by their very nature act in order to gain something when they act. There is no such thing as absolutely selfless behavior. People who are selfless find some kind of deep satisfaction in altruistic behavior, even when altruism means suffering some kind of loss. Now, actually, Professor Egan is wrong. We were created good. We do have those traces of original justice where we really love the way we're supposed to love. But the problem is we can't sustain that. We always keep falling back into our selfishness, our selfish deeds that are overtly sinful and our selfish love. Now, the best way I can describe this, some of you have heard me describe this before. The best way that I can describe this is picture, picture a romantic dinner. You're with your beloved, you're with your wife, you're with your husband, you're with your fiance. And it's just perfect. I mean, the food is wonderful, even if it's supposed to be tasteless, but <laughs> that's another topic. The food is wonderful, and the music is playing in the background. The stars are in your eyes, and the moon is in the wine. And you look into those deep eyes, and you say, Darling, I love you. And that pool of liquid in her eyes looks back at you, and she says, Why? <laughs> and you say, because of all the things you are, because you're so wonderful, you're so kind, you're so gentle, you're so wise, you're, you're such a great mother to our children. I, you, you make me feel complete. I'd just be lost without you. And we look at that and we say, oh, is that good? Yeah, it's much better than I hate your guts. You know, Is that love? Yeah, it's better than ah, old battle axe. Is it selfish? Absolutely. Why do I love you? Because of all the things that you are. What happens when I stop getting what is reinforcing me? The love dies. Now picture the same romantic dinner with our love, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ looks deeply into our eyes as he says he wants to do. Right? Our eyes look into each other. He looks into her eyes and he says, my darling, I love you. And we in a fit of madness look back and say, why? And he would not say, because of all the things you are, filthy sinner who nailed me to a cross and spit on me and tore my flesh from my bones. He 
you would say, because of all the things I am, because I am love, I will always love you. Can we see the difference? Can we see the difference? One only loves as long as we get back that reinforcement. The other will always love. One is eternally sustainable, fit for eternity, and one is not. So actually, we come to realize, I realize at this point, that I needed to repent, not just of my overt sinfulness, but I needed to repent even of much of my love and much of my good that I thought was love and good, but it's not the love and the good of heaven. It was all selfish love and good. It was not God's love. Yes, there are two loves, a human love that is not fit for heaven and the love of the Trinity, which is the only love fit for heaven. Now, again, this is not just you know, John babbling on and on. This is what Jesus himself told us in the Sermon on the Mount. Again, let's go back to the scriptures. So let's go back to the scriptures and go to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5. We'll start in verse 44. Matthew 5, 44. Where Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies. Not just that romantic dinner with our beloved and you're such a wonderful person. I feel complete when you're with me and I'd be lost without you. Love your enemies, those who nail you to the cross. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. Sound like Genesis 1? So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. Sons are supposed to grow up to look like their father. Children look like their parents. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Because he is love. It doesn't depend on what he gets back. And then look how Jesus illustrates this. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. If we love that way, what's the difference between those who have the Holy Spirit? What's the difference between Christians and Jews and Muslims and Hindus and atheists who are all kind and good in their own way? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. We are to be perfect in holiness, loving with the love of the Trinity, partakers of the divine nature. This is what we are called to. This is the watt of salvation. This is what we are supposed to love as. We need to turn from any love and good that is not our Lord's, our God's love and good. Because if we continue to love that way and we continue to be good that way, we are not fit for heaven. We need to repent of that selfish love and selfish good and partake of God's selfless love as the effect of grace. We are called to repent, not just of our evil works, but our dead works. Let's take again a look at the scriptures. Let's go to Hebrews 6 and verse 1. We'll notice something rather interesting. Hebrews 6 and verse 1, where we read a little bit about repentance. where the author of Hebrews says, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from evil works. No, that's not what it says. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. Repentance from dead works, like Paul's righteousness that he said was not the righteousness of God. Dead works like our selfish love and our selfish good that are dead because they are not worthy of eternal life because they're not sustainable. Now, we understand this, that we need to repent not just of our overt evil, not just of our, our adultery and our fornication and our pornography and our lying and our gossip and our stealing and our hate and our anger, but also we need to repent, turn from our selfish love and our selfish good to partake of God's selfless love. Now, that kind of changes our examination of conscience. That changes the way we go to confession. I, sometimes we say, oh, what am I going to bring to confession? What have I done? Remember, what have I not done? How have I loved? Have I loved with the love of heaven? Or am I still loving like a mosquito who can't be reconciled to God? 
And finally, I began to understand this. I began to see what was happening. I began to see what Christianity was. It wasn't about the rubrics of the church. It wasn't about prophecy. It wasn't about theology. It wasn't about all the things I was learning in school. It was something so much greater. It was the literal miracle. It was the miraculous transformation of my nature. I remember falling down in a prayer closet and praying to God and feeling so completely trapped that I turned to God and I said, okay, God, I get it. I get it now. I finally understand. I need to love selflessly like you love selflessly. I want to love selflessly like you love selflessly for entirely selfish reasons. I was trapped. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want to be happy. I want to be fulfilled. I want to be right. All about me, even spiritually. And I was utterly trapped. I could not escape my very nature. I could change the things that I do, but I can't change what I am. I can't change that pull that sometimes rises up to, to nobility and to holiness, but most of the time pulls down to self. Whether it's the self that sins overtly in evil or whether it's the self that loves because of what it gets, I keep falling back into this self. And there's no other way that I can be because that is the stain of original sin. Not what we have done, what we are, how we think, how we are, that pull towards self. And I realized I needed a miracle. I was standing on one side of the Red Sea. I needed to be on the other side of the Red Sea, and I can't swim that far. I needed a miracle greater than the parting of the Red Sea. The miraculous transformation of my very nature into the selfless love of God. I couldn't do that. That's a miracle, the miracle of grace. We see there, there were really only two ends in life. Everything in life boiled down to one thing or the other. Everything we do in life, we either do for love or for self. The opposite of love is not hate. That's a symptom. The opposite of love is self. Either we live for self or we live for love. Everything we do boils down to one of those two ends. Either we live our humanity in our selfishness. Satan is the ultimately selfish being. We keep drifting further and further away from selflessness, right? But there's not absolute evil and battling absolute good. There's only absolute good, which is God and departure from absolute good. Satan has gone the furthest away from absolute good so that there's no, there's no more good left. He's entirely selfish. And for us, sometimes we're really selfish. Sometimes we're not so selfish, but we depart from that perfect selfless love of God. Everything we do is either for love or for self. These are the two ends in life. It all boils down to this. And there are many different levels of the selfishness. Sometimes the selfishness is personal. I exalt myself over you. Sometimes it's as a couple. You know, it's you and me against the world. Sometimes it's as a family. You know, my family, I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll trample all over your family to take care of my family. Sometimes it's as, as a town. I remember, remember one day I was, I was working with a school in, in my neighborhood. And it was a fairly prosperous neighborhood, a well-educated neighborhood. And they were having this thing about social justice and, and tolerance and all of that. And all the high schoolers were all over this about how tolerant they would be and how kind they would be and how accepting they would be. And just north of us was another town, which was actually kind of poor and not well-educated, primarily a particular ethnicity and a great rival of this town. And I turned to the kids and said, well, what, what about the kids from this town? And they said, oh, no, that's, that's different. I mean, that's different. You know, our selfishness can be as a town. It can be as a nation. It can be even be as a species. So many different levels, but it's still where we choose some self or some collective self over others. This is an absolutely foundational concept. If we don't understand this, we do not understand anything. If we get love wrong, we get everything wrong because God is love. If we get love wrong, we get everything wrong. That's what's happening in the world. We're sold on this lie of love about self-fulfillment rather than love about self-sacrifice. And we're choking on it. Get love wrong, you get everything wrong. If we don't understand this, we don't understand what salvation is. We don't understand what grace is. And if we don't understand what salvation and grace are, we don't understand the flame of love. Now, thankfully, actually, you don't have to understand it. I keep coming back to this. It's not just about knowledge and education. We do this so we can do our jobs better. 
But frankly, the Holy Spirit will do what the Holy Spirit will do in spite of ourselves. He will lead us to become selfless love. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what grace does. But so much the better if we can work with it, if we understand it and can work with the process. In fact, Jesus spent almost a year and a half instructing Elizabeth Kindleman about this topic before she was ready to receive the flame of love. Jesus pointed this out to me, that the flame of love didn't come right away. All of 1961 and the first part of 1962 was all about Jesus teaching Elizabeth this selflessness, this forsaking of self so that we can live for others. It is foundational to the flame of love. Let's again go to the diary and see this. It's, it's striking. So let's go to the very beginning of the diary, page seven. And we'll see how Jesus laid the foundation here. That's why we're laying the foundation here. We need this to understand the flame of love. Jesus started here with Elizabeth, not with the flame of love. Jesus says to her on page seven, look at my disfigured face and my tortured sacred body. Didn't I suffer to save souls? Believe live streaming is on. There we go. We've got the stream back. So yes, to come back to this. So Jesus says this to Elizabeth, and she says, at that very moment, I made acts of faith, hope, and charity, begging him to never allow that I be separated from him. Let him chain me to his sacred feet so I would always be united to him. Thus, I would always feel sheltered. He then asked me to renounce myself because I tend to be distracted and worldly. Interesting. She wants to be chained to Jesus' feet. Why? Because she wants to feel sheltered. And Jesus comes back and says, you have to renounce yourself because you tend to be distracted and worldly. And then Jesus says, I do not force you. You have your free will only if you want it. This has to be free. Love has to be free. And Elizabeth says, I tried with all my strength. Afterward, everything fell into place, drawing me close to him. Right? We get this right. We start to get it. We've got to get this right for everything to fall into place. Everything fell into place, drawing me closer to him. But yet he kept urging me, she writes. He kept urging me. Jesus says, I want to give you great graces, but you must renounce yourself completely. These were harsh words for my reason, Elizabeth writes. This is why I asked him, am I capable of doing this? And Jesus said, you must only will it. Leave the rest up to me. And again, very next page, page eight, Jesus comes back to the same topic again because it's so important. Renounce yourself completely so that nothing would tie me to this world. I gave away everything to my children. Later on, I felt that I had done the right thing. Now I had nowhere to rest my head peacefully. And our Lord kept urging me, renounce yourself. He keeps coming back to this topic because it's foundational. 1962, March. So we're getting close to the flame of love. Jesus says to Elizabeth, accept faithfully the sacrifices that I ask of you for my cause. Many ask repeatedly to share in my works, right? Lord, I want to serve you. Lord, I want to be with you. Lord, I'll do anything for you. Now, many are asked repeatedly to share in my works, but when they must accept a sacrifice in my own hands, they're afraid of me. Why? Because they're concerned about ourselves. My daughter, renounce yourself. I keep insisting on this because you can only share in my work of redemption if you live united with me at every moment. Jesus redeemed us by pouring his life out for us. If we're going to partake in his life of redemption, in his work of redemption, we need to do the same thing. And no longer be seeking for ourselves, no longer seeking salvation for ourselves, no longer thinking gain for ourselves, giving up ourselves as Jesus did, emptying himself so that he could save us. That's how we partake in his work of redemption, only if we live united with him at every moment. April 8th, very close to the flame of love. Jesus says, do not seek yourself. I have constantly said that I want you entirely for myself. Renounce yourself. Nothing must exist between you and I. Elizabeth says, Lord, I'm only a beginner. And Jesus says, do not grow discouraged, daughter, because you must begin somewhere. So if any of you are thinking, oh, man, I, I don't know if I can do this, just like Elizabeth asked Jesus. I don't know if I'm ready for this. You've got to begin somewhere. Where you are is the place to begin. And now it's time to go forward in this love. Jesus said, my daughter, renounce your will. 
I ask this so many times because you can only share in my work of redemption if you live united with me totally and without interruption at every moment. This, as I say, is utterly foundational. And this brings us now back to the meditation on the five wounds of the cross. How do we know the difference between God's love and our love? How did God show us the way we are supposed to love in contrast to the way that we love that's all about self, even spiritually? How many of us are more concerned about getting to heaven than we are about giving joy to our beloved? I tell people, your spiritual horizons will open up when you forget about trying to get to heaven. Forget about trying to get to heaven. Forget about how you're doing spiritually. Forget about your spiritual growth. Focus on bringing joy to our beloved. Focus on living for him entirely and trust him to bring you to heaven. Trust him to bring about your growth. Forget about yourself, even spiritually. Abandon ourselves to our Lord in complete trust. Love him alone. Forget about ourselves so we can love him entirely. This is the love he showed us on the cross. Let's go back to the scriptures. 1 John 4, verses 9 to 12. 1 John 4, verses 9 to 12. Let me share my screen once more. <clears throat> By this, the love of God was manifested in us. Okay, He's going to show us this is the love of God. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is his love. Jesus emptying himself and coming to die on the cross for us. The father sending his beloved son to us. We think of Jesus on the cross. Can you imagine the father watching his son die at our hands? And then look at verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Not with our human love, not with our selfish love, not only loving while things come back and we're reinforcing you, make us feel good. Even when it hurts. Beloved, if God so loved us, giving his son, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love, not our love, his love is perfected in us. Be perfect as your heavenly father in heaven is perfect. Same thing in Paul. Let's go to Romans 5, verses 5 to 8. Where Paul writes, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God, not our mosquito love, not our selfish love, not our human love, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died, not for the righteous, right? He died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though maybe for a good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love, not our mosquito love, not human love. God demonstrates his own love toward us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's love. That's the love we're called to. That's the love we see in the wounds of the cross. Let's go back to the first letter of John. First John in verse 316. Not the gospel, not the golden verse, but first John 316. We know love by this, right? How do we recognize God's love? How do we recognize God's thoughts that are higher than our thoughts? We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And notice the second half. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We are called to a life of Jesus' love, constantly pouring our lives out for others. That's what we're called to. That's what Christianity is. That's what this is about. That leads us to the practices of the flame of love. They are all about practically everyday life, living the love of God, the selfless love of God, participating in his life of redemption. I tell people, you know, until, until we are ready to embrace, not just endure, but to embrace the love of the voluntary poverty of the incarnation. 
No, Jesus emptied himself. He's God. And he comes as a baby who, who, who goes to the bathroom and who smells and has to be changed and who can throw up and you know, has to be taken care of and gets cold and stubs their toe. Until we embrace the love of the voluntary poverty of the incarnation. Until we are willing to embrace, not just endure, embrace the love of the voluntary suffering of the cross. We do not have the love of heaven. We are not ready for heaven. Until we are willing to embrace the love of the voluntary poverty of the, of the incarnation and the love of the voluntary suffering of the cross. We're not loving with God's love. We're not ready for heaven. We can think practically. Think practically. I think we're in heaven for 10,000 years. Except not that we keep time in heaven. But 10,000 years into heaven, the father comes to me and he says, you know, John, I spun up a new universe. And true to form, they messed up. And I need you to go die for them, just like Jesus died for you. Am I going to say, oh, nope, no way, no how. I paid my dues. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I've done my part. Or am I going to say, of course, Dad, when can I go? Just like Jesus did. Because that's what love does. That's what love does. And this brings us to the meditation on the five wounds. Can you see how brilliant the flame of love is? Every time we meditate on the five wounds, we are brought back to this love. Now, meditation on the five wounds is not unique to the flame of love. Right? St. Clair of Assisi used to meditate on the five wounds. Right? Praise and honor be given to you, Lord Jesus Christ, by reason of the sacred wound in your right hand, by this holy and adorable wound, she goes on. Praise and honor be given to you, Lord Jesus, by reason of the sacred wound in your left hand. You know, the Palatines of a Good Friday prayer. I kiss the wounds of your sacred head with sorrow deep and true. May every thought of my mind today be an act of perfect love for you. I kiss the wounds of your sacred feet with sorrow deep and true. May every step I take today be an act of perfect love for you. And there are many other such meditations upon the five wounds. But there is something unique about the way our Blessed Mother asks us to meditate on the five wounds. Again, let's go to the diary. Let's read it verbatim. Mary says, speaking of the family holy hours, she says, start the holy hour. Start making the sign of the cross five times, offering yourselves to the eternal father through the wounds of my divine son. Do the same at the conclusion. Sign yourselves this way when you get up and when you go to bed and during the day. This will bring you closer to the eternal father through my divine son, filling your heart with graces. Let's think about that. So again, our Blessed Mother didn't ask us when meditating upon the five wounds to focus on the suffering of Jesus. Although that's important. Jesus asked us to do that elsewhere, right? She didn't ask us to focus on the role of our sins in nailing Jesus to the cross, although that's important too. She asked us specifically to offer ourselves to the Heavenly Father through the wounds. She is inviting us into the love of the cross. The only way we can offer ourselves to the Father is to love as Jesus loves, to love with the love of the cross, to love with his wounds. That's how we offer ourselves to the Father, through the love of the cross. It is through the cross and the love of the cross that we can be an offering to the Father. We are invited into the love of the cross. Now, a couple of things about the meditation on the five wounds, a couple of practical things. <clears throat> Note that it is a meditation. It's not a prayer. Sometimes I feel like this is an uphill battle. We, we have in our prayer outline this, this, this example of a meditation on the five wounds, right? I kiss the wound of your sacred left hand with sorrow deep and true. I kiss the wound of your left hand with sorrow deep and true. But it's not a fixed form prayer. It's a meditation that we're asked to, right? Jesus, when speaking about this, says, do not be distracted when you make the sign of the cross. Think about the three divine persons. Make the sign of the cross five times while thinking of my five wounds. Always look at my eyes bathed in blood from so many blows that I received even from you. It's a meditation. And there's a great depth to this meditation. There's no end to this meditation. Usually when I, when I wake up in the morning, just like our Blessed Mother says, when I go to bed, I'm thinking about this. And sometimes I gotta watch the clock because I can be late by thinking of the rich meditation of this love into which we are invited. This love, which is the only way we can be an offering acceptable to the Heavenly Father. Now, neither Jesus nor Mary specified which five wounds. I'm often asked this question, which five wounds? They didn't say. 
And many the church has looked at this many different ways, and saints have looked at this many different ways. Sometimes they look at the head, the hands, the feet, the wounds of the scourging, and the side. Other times it's left hand, right hand, left foot, right foot, side. More recently, there's been a lot of emphasis on the pain of the wound of Jesus' shoulder. You know, long ago in the Middle Ages, traditionally there were 5,475 wounds of Christ, or 5,466. In fact, it led to the tradition in the Middle Ages of praying 15 Our Fathers every day, so that at the end of the entire year, we would have prayed 5,475 Our Fathers for each of the wounds of Jesus. So again, these aren't right and wrong. These are all pious practices. They're all fine. It's not a matter of right and wrong and which is the right way. Focus on what is important. What is important is we meditate on the five wounds, any five wounds. Don't do three. Don't do seven because our blessed mother said five. Jesus said five. But what is important is meditation on the five wounds showing us what we must become, what we are called to in salvation, what salvation is all about. I say, until we are willing to love with the love that we are see in the wounds of Jesus on the cross, we are not an acceptable offering to the Father. Only through those wounds can we become an acceptable offering to the Father. We are called to that love. That's the important thing. The cross points the way to holiness. The cross points the way to holiness. Remember 1 Peter 1, we read it before. Be holy as I am holy. Jesus showed us that holiness on the cross. Are we holy? Are we holy? If not, what are we waiting for? Is there something holding us back? We need to know what holiness is so that we can be holy. and We can work with the Holy Spirit in it. Holiness is not our natural goodness. It's not our homespun wisdom. It's not being a nice person like every other person on earth is, no matter what their religion is. It is a miracle that comes as the effect of grace. Holiness is shown in the wounds of Jesus on the cross. This is the love we must be. Why do we have to be holy in love as God does? Because that's the love we need for eternity. A love based upon self-fulfillment fails eternity. There are two big problems with a love that is based upon self-fulfillment. And this is the great lie that is being shoved down our children's throats. We're shoved down our throats. It comes in every Hollywood movie. That love is about our self-fulfillment, right? We meet someone, they make us feel fulfilled, and we call this love. Well, that kind of love has got two problems. One is that kind of love does not lead to peace. It actually leads to strife. Because inevitably, my self-fulfillment is going to conflict with your self-fulfillment. And when that happens, we have a problem. And increasingly in our society, when my self-fulfillment interferes with your self-fulfillment, it leads to anger and strife and even violence. If that self-fulfillment stops, what happens? Our relationships become ugly. That once were beautiful. Love based upon self-fulfillment leads to strife, not to peace. It is the love that gives up that to which we even have a right that leads us to peace. And again, a love based upon self-fulfillment is not eternally sustainable. Because when that self-fulfillment ends, when we're no longer fulfilled, the love dies. For the sake of time, because we're running long, I'm not going to go to these scriptures. They're in your notes. But think about it, again, very practically. If our love depends on having our needs met and being fulfilled, what happens when we no longer have any needs? What happens when we're in heaven? What happens after the resurrection? What happens when we no longer have any needs, when our every need is met? Right, Hebrews 2, that God is going to put all things under our feet, that we're going to inherit all things. What will happen if our love is based upon meeting our needs when we have no more needs, we'll have no more love. That's why the love of heaven must be the love that is entirely selfless, that doesn't depend on what we need. Right? The whole point of the book of Ecclesiastes, right? Solomon had everything. He had every wealth. He tried everything under the sun. He did everything he could do. He had free reign. He had everything. And at the end, what did he say? Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. All is a chasing after wind. If we do not learn the love of the cross, we do not have the love of heaven, a love that is fit for eternity. We must change. We must repent so that we can change to be fit for eternity. We must change to love like God. Let's come back to that critical scripture again because it is so important. The very, very last words of Jesus to his disciples before going to the garden. John 17 
and verse 26. Now do we see why these are the words that Jesus left his disciples with? Sometimes we look at that and we say, well, what is Jesus talking about? Why is he talking about this? Can he give us something more substantial as his last words? These are substantial. These are the most important words he can speak. I made your name known to them and I will make it known. Why? So that the love with which you love me, the love of the Holy Trinity, the love of the cross, so that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. Most important words that Jesus can give us because that's our key to eternity. Just doing good things is not enough. Just being nice people, as we think, is not enough. Otherwise, the Pharisees would be the best Christians ever. Right? In fact, I wish I had time for this. Maybe another time we'll do a section on the Sermon on the Mount in light of the flame of love. And it's very eye-opening that the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount is not to give us a new set of commandments. It's to illustrate the problem with the law and the righteousness of the Pharisees. The whole specific purpose statement of the, of the Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew 5.20 where he says, unless your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. And people must have been shocked because they were so righteous. They did all the right things. And the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount is to point out the difference between that righteousness, which is inadequate, and the righteousness to which Christians are called. Right, when we think of Cornelius, we're going to talk about Cornelius the Centurion in the third section of, of, uh, of this retreat. Cornelius is a good man. God commends him as a good man. He says, your, your, your alms and your righteous deeds have come to heaven. So Cornelius is a good man. And yet the angel tells him, send to Job and get Peter who will tell you what you need to be saved. So all of Cornelius' human goodness, his mosquito goodness was not enough. He needed something else to be saved. He needed the love that comes from only God as the miracle, as the effect of grace. Christians always love. Christians always love with this love. It must become our nature, partakers of the divine nature. We always love because it is God's nature. And if God lives in us, this is the way we love. We are running long as I wonder what we would do today. But let's go to Matthew 5, verses 38 to 42. Again, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, verses 38 to 42. And again, we can sometimes misunderstand Jesus' point here. Jesus says to us, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Now, again, Jesus is not giving us commands here. This isn't a new command of magnifying the law, saying, oh, someone hits you on the right cheek, you give them the left. He's making a point of the kind of righteousness that we need. He's making a point that our life is always about loving the other. Our life is always about loving the other. When someone strikes us on the, on the right cheek, our concern is not about defending us or about us at all. It's about what's best for them. Now, sometimes what's best for them is to say, don't do that again. You're hurting yourself. You're destroying your own soul. You're destroying our family. We have this problem with abusive relationships where people want to stay thinking it's holy. No, sometimes love is don't do that again. You're destroying our family. You're destroying yourself. At other times, perhaps in rare occasions, it might be hit me on the other one. Not in the case of abuse. Don't misunderstand that. The point here is that the thought is always for the other person. You know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is all about us taking vengeance. Now when someone strikes us, our thought is not defending ourselves. Our thought is what is best for them? How do I love them? If they want to sue me, they want to take my shirt, maybe we need to defend our rights so that we stop them from doing frivolous lawsuits. But our thought is about them, not us. Christians never stop loving. Christians always love even when it's unfair. I'm going to go to another scripture, as late as it is. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Again, Corinth, Corinth is a mess. And in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul is addressing the problem of Christians taking each other to court. And he says, this is a terrible shame. How dare you take each other to court? And he comes down to verse 7. 
And he says, in verse six, he says, brother goes to law with brother and that before unbelievers. Actually, then it's already a defeat for you. You've already lost on what's important. It's already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? Yes, we have to do this with wisdom. But the important point is we always love, even if it's unfair. Even if it's unfair, we love. When we understand love this way, it changes everything. Everything. It becomes very practical. Again, we've let lots of theory. Let's come down really, really practically as we move towards conclusion. Christianity is a life of always taking the smallest piece of pie. Right? Christianity is a life of always, not sometimes, not when we feel like it, not when we feel generous. Christianity is a life of always taking the smallest piece of pie. Well, almost. Maybe our husband and wife is on a diet and we'll just have to we'll just have to suffer and take the bigger piece that we leave them the small piece. <laughs> you know? But Christianity is a life of always taking the smallest piece of pie. If we don't want a life of always taking the smallest piece of pie, we don't want Christianity. Let's think of very practical things in life. Why do we brush our teeth? Why do we brush our teeth? Is it that we don't want to go out and be embarrassed by our buffalo breath? Well, because we want to make the world more pleasant for others around us. I'll use a very crass example. Pardon me if I use a crass example, but I want to do it to show just how everyday this is. You're sitting on the toilet and the roll is almost done. How many of you have been in that position, right? And if you're like me, you think, oh boy, I hope I can stretch this out so that uh, I don't have to be the one who changes the roll. Thinking about myself rather than thinking, oh, even if it's not finished, maybe I'll change the roll anyway and put the, the little one on top so that the next person doesn't have to do it. All right, we look at a clump of bananas. How do we choose which banana to take? Typically, we look for the one that's the best. Rather, might we say, let me take the one that's the worst so no one else has to take that one and I save the good ones for someone else. Life about others. Life always taking the smallest piece of pie. How do we choose what clothes to wear? Right? We typically choose our clothes because it's what we want. We want to be comfortable or we want to show off our clothes and look nice. So maybe rather than being comfortable, we need to make the world a little more beautiful. Or rather than looking so beautiful, we need to dress a little more grungily because where we're going, someone might need help with their house chores and we can help them out. See, we choose for others, not for self. How do we decide what to eat? There's a lot about that in the flame of love. Most of us eat what we want to eat. Instead, how do we eat for others? How do we decide what to eat as an act of love for others? How do we spend our money? For most of us, when it comes to money, we want to get the most for the least. And actually, it's our personal greed that tends to drive corporate greed. Corporate Corporations are greedy because we enable them to be greedy, because we want the most for the least. Rather than thinking of, when I spend my money, how is this an act of love? How do we drive? How do we get in the car in the morning to go to work? And most of us are thinking, how do I get there as fast as possible as long as I'm safe? Thinking about us. When we get behind the wheel, our job is to love the other people on the road. When we get behind the wheel, our job is to love the other people on the road. How do we choose to spend our time? I right? usually we spend our time the way we want to spend our time. We want to watch our entertainment. We want to do the things we like. We like our hobbies. We want to do what we want. No. How do we spend our time in love for others? Sometimes it needs to recharge ourselves. We do need to do something. Most of the time we're thinking about ourselves and how to spend our time, not others. We are called to the glory of God. We are called to love as God loves. The greatest miracle ever in a million little acts of love. We must love. We must live like God. This is what we're called to. I'll go to just a couple of more scriptures. Let's go to Colossians 1 and verse 26 and 27 to see what we are called to. Many of us have never heard this. Many of us don't realize this is what salvation is. This is what the church is all about. This is what we're called to be. Not just nice and good people the way we think we're supposed to be and go to church on Sunday and we go to heaven. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about being partakers of the divine nature, literally partaking of the glory of God and loving as he loves. Look at this in Colossians 1 and verse 27. To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is what? Christ in you. Literal union with Jesus, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Again, we are called to partake, to rejoice in the glory of God. Look at this, Romans 5, 2 again. 
right, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And in verse 5, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That section from Ephesians that we so often read at the beginning of our sentence, I think it's Ephesians 3.19, right? To know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to what? The fullness of God. That's what the salvation thing is all about. That's what our Christianity is all about. That's what the flame of love is leading us to, to partake of divine nature, to be realized that's what we're called to. That's what salvation is. We are called to partake of the divine life. We are called to divinity. Again, this isn't John Solomon's madness. Let me turn to the liturgy of the church. In the liturgy of the church, in the divine office, on December 30th, we have a treatise on the refutation of all heresies from St. Hippolytus. St. Hippolytus is very close to the apostles. Hippolytus was a disciple of Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was taught by John, the apostle. And look at what he writes. When we have come to know the true God, both our bodies and our souls will be immortal and incorruptible. We shall enter the kingdom of heaven because while we lived on earth, we acknowledged heaven's king. Friends of God and co-heirs with Christ, we shall be subject to no evil desires or inclinations or any affliction of body or soul, for we shall have become divine. Whatever evil you may have suffered being man, it is God that sent it to you precisely because you are man. But equally, when you have been deified, God has promised you a share in every one of his own attributes. The saying, know yourself, means therefore that we should recognize and acknowledge in ourselves the God who made us in his own image. For if we do this, we in turn will be recognized and acknowledged by our maker. So let us not be at enmity with ourselves, but change our way of life without delay. For Christ, who is God, exalted above all creation, has taken away man's sins and not only redemption, not only taken away our sins, and has refashioned our fallen nature, sanctification. In the beginning, God made man in his image and so gave proof of his love for us. If we obey his holy commands and learn to imitate his goodness, we shall be like him and he will honor us. God is not beggarly and for the sake of his own glory, he has given us a share in his divinity. Do we realize that's what salvation is? That's what the church is all about? This is what the flame of love is all about. This subject of divinization is in the diary. Here, look at these few quotes from the diary. May 17th, 1963. Jesus says to Elizabeth, you are my little drop of water. Immerse yourself in the intoxicating wine of my infinite divinity both in its life-giving power and its sweet aroma that you pour out for me. And this is an interesting reference. This is a reference to a part of the Mass. And again, it grew out of practicality in the early days of the church, when the first church first began. In those days, you didn't serve wine straight. It was too strong. You always cut it with water. And so when they were preparing the Lord's Supper, they would take the wine, they would pour it into the chalice, and they would add water, as you would normally do in any household in that day. And the fathers of the church in this saw a great analogy of the mixing together of the water and the wine. And they made it part of our liturgy. So if you notice, when we have the offering at Mass, when the water, there's a little drop of water which is poured into the wine. And the deacon, or if there is no deacon, the priest, the celebrant, has a little quiet prayer that you may or may not have heard because it is to be prayed quietly. And in that prayer, when he drops the little drop of water into the wine, like Jesus said to Elizabeth, he prays, by the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. We relive that in every mass and we relive it every time we pray the flame of love. January 19th, 1964, Jesus says, My Elizabeth, I am giving you the gift of my divinity. That's what we're called to. And perhaps most astoundingly, look at this reference to the unity prayer. March 6, 1964. 
I believe, I believe it's a Saturday, a first Saturday. And Elizabeth writes, prostrating myself before him, my soul breathed words of profound humility that he aroused in me. Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. The divine praises, right? Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. And Jesus stops her. He did not let me continue. Jesus says, your homage pleases me, my little one. But I will explain the words, true God and true man, right? Like we recite in every creed. If this were not true, how could you come closer to me? I let myself be known to you as true God and true man. Not only you, but all those who eat my body and drink my blood. As true God, I penetrate your heart. And as true man, I speak to you. Because my human heart beats at the same rhythm as my divinity. Your heart beats to the same rhythm as my heart, right? May our hearts beat in unison, or literally may our hearts beat together. Your heart beats to the same rhythm as my heart. Do you know what this means? It means that you participate in my divinity. All who feel with me, this is again a reference to the unity prayer. In English, it's very hard to translate the Hungarian, where it says, may our souls be in harmony. It actually is literally talking about our intestines. He says, may our intestines, the place where we have our deepest feelings, feel together. In other words, may our feelings be the same. So he says, it means that you participate in my divinity. All who feel with me and whose thoughts are my thoughts, may our thoughts be one, right? As one, will receive this participation in his divinity. Whoever lives this way can only bless. Why? Because now Jesus is alive in us. We have divine life in us and God always blesses because he is love. All who feel with me and whose thoughts are with me will receive this participation. Whoever lives this way can only bless. This blessing increases the effect of my work of redemption. This effect makes you saints. That's what we're called to be in the flame of love. That's why we start with a meditation on the five wounds. It shows us what we ought to become, what we're called to. It's the what of salvation. The meditation of the five wounds is our invitation into the very love and life of God. But there's a problem. There's a problem. As I mentioned, we cannot change our nature by ourselves. That only happens as the effect of grace. That's the how of salvation. And that's what we're going to come back and talk about next month. Hopefully a little short of time because we only have one presentation. But that's the how. The what is the meditation on the five wounds, right? That shows us the love we're called to. The how is by the effect of grace, which leads us to that complete unity with Jesus, which blinds Satan and saves souls. So what are the important points we want to remember as, as we end this particular retreat? Number one, we must repent of not just our overt evil, but also much of our good and much of our love because it's not the love of heaven. We must love with God's entirely selfless love. Not once in a hundred quadrillion bazillion years has God ever been selfish. And if we are going to inhabit eternity, we must be at the same way where not once in a hundred billion quadrillion zillion years will we ever do anything selfish anymore. We always choose for love, not self. This, this, is the miracle of Christianity. And the cross and Jesus' wounds point the way. To say, but how does it happen? How do we work with the process? How do we work with that movement of grace and partake of the effect of grace? That's what we're going to cover next. So remember these things. Take a look at your life. This is why this is retreat. It's not just the words. Please take the time to pray about this. Take the time to meditate about this. Go into your prayer closet. Go into your chapel. Go before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament and ask him to show your love. Ask him to show your soul, our souls. Help him to penetrate deeply into our being and see where by grace we are loving as God loves. We are. Blessed be God that he has made us beautiful and is making us beautiful, fulfilling his promise to us to make us in his image. And we're also going to see, you know, there's lots of things that we thought were pretty good about ourselves that really are not worthy of heaven. And we need to repent of those so that joy of joy, we can be made beautiful so we can partake of the love of the wounds of the cross. We can be one with our Lord Jesus. 
that will displace Satan. That will break his influence. That will bring about the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And that is what the flame of love is all about.